We give our first impressions of the new Jeep Gladiator pickup truck. Mercedes-Benz makes a big decision on a small car. And why aren't electric vehicle charging outlets standardized? Next on Talking Cars. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Mike Quincy. I'm Keith Barry. And I'm John Lincove. So this week, Mercedes announced that they're no longer going to be selling the smart car in the United States. Hmm. Boo-hoo or not? Huh. Woo-hoo? Yeah. Woo-hoo. I, I, does anyone notice? <laughs> that's, that's what John said. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. even know they were still for sale. Yeah. So uh, Consumer Reports reached out to the company, and in a statement, Mercedes said, after much careful consideration, Smart will discontinue its battery electric Smart EQ for two model in the U.S. and Canadian markets at the conclusion of model year 2019. A number of factors, including a declining microcar market in the U.S. and Canada, are central to this decision. Declining. Was there a micro, yeah. micro car market <laughs> aside from the uh, era of you know four dollar gas? <laughs> so, so Consumer Reports actually has a, a number of, uh, of models that we've tested. In fact, we went up to Canada to buy our first smart car way back, I believe, it was in two thousand and seven, two thousand eight. Yeah, yep. And uh, John, you've driven all of them, as have I. Yep. Um, what What do you think about the smart car going away? Yeah, we we worked with our uh, Canadian equivalent uh, consumer organization. They they got it. We brought it in. Um, that was weird, the diesel one. I mean, it just, it, it was... Three cylinders. Very lurchy. Yeah, yeah. three cylinder diesel yep. engine, the um, single sequential gearbox, yeah. but it was a single gear. It's like a, a normal sequential gearbox will have one gear engaged while it's driving as anticipation so that the shifts are quicker. This one almost seemed as if, because it was a single gear, it, it was slower. He's like someone learning to drive, drive stick exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Imagine mm -hmm. accelerating and it goes to shift a gear and then it stops and nothing happens. Right. And then and then, uh, it kind of clicks right back in. And you, it's weird because Mercedes certainly knows how to build a transmission. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, or, or you know, develop one with your partner. Um, it, well, what I found interesting, so we had it in Yonkers. I drove it to New York City for an event. Then I had to drive it all the way out to Colchester. A, I was scared that someone in New York City was going to pick it up as a joke <laughs> and put it in a pickup truck or move it. So I parked in a garage. B, it was... It was Buffeted by trailers, tra tractor trailers, buffeted by big pickup trucks, you know, moving about the lane like this. It, it, it was a city urban car as they pitched it, but it was really not great at that either. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it even got less, uh, less fuel economy than it's the Toyota Prius. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it, at 36 miles a gallon in our tests. I mean, 36 miles a gallon you can get from an SUV today. You can get for a hybrid SUV, yeah. from, from a hybrid large car. Yeah. Um, you can get a used Prius for less than the price, and it's going to be incredibly reliable. There's, there's no reason. And the, the electric version of it only had a 58-mile range. And it's funny. You mentioned New York City. The NYPD uses a lot of those for traffic enforcement. Yeah. And it's... I think it's the most that I've seen them, that and the car to go uh, service in Austin and a couple of the places. I, I have a friend who's ex NYPD cop, and he said that they would. He was he was NYPD, not traffic, and he mm. said that it was, it was they were the butt of the of jokes but to drive those they things can fit around. Like five of them into a parking space. You can do that if you are law enforcement. Yes, you cannot in the United States largely do that. Park uh, like a motorcycle. Exactly, and I think that's the reason why these are popular, at least somewhat popular in the rest of the world versus in the U.S. Because we don't have as, as a huge parking crunch in most parts of the country. And in the places where parking is at a premium, they still paint lines for the space and there's still a meter for every space. You know, it, it, it kind of made sense in Europe, developing world, just not in the U.S. The, the yeah. vast spaces, the infrastructure is not designed, like you said. And also, it's just not what Americans want. You know, well, I remember. Right. I was going to say, Scion tried selling its IQ. Yeah, and which I've, is a I've tested that for another publication, and I mean, the most. I mean, it was terrifying to drive on the highway. It was really fun to go in the middle of a two-lane street and just crank the wheel and just. Uh, that that was fun, but that's not the intended purpose yeah. of the car. Uh, however, uh, it, it. I mean, uh, that car was gone in in seconds. Yeah, the right. Aston Martin Signet was was it was based on it, yeah, uh, right. which is kind of funny. But I mean, that's a historical footnote. I mean, these are these are these are not cars that are these are cars that are easy to park in places where every every uh, inch or every centimeter usually right. is is at a premium, and that's just not North America. I, I I think it was interesting. Only positive really for it is that it came out right came to the United States with the gas crunch, and maybe it spurred people looking at cars differently. Mm. You know, I didn't. We're not gonna. We didn't see a suburban owner get into a smart car, right? Unless, and if you're out there, 
let right. us know. <laughs> Seriously. <That's laughs> you know, you had suburban owners going down to small SUVs, but you didn't have them going to smart cars. Um, you know, but it, it advanced the conversation of fuel economy. Yeah, they'd pick up CR, they'd see, oh my, it's only 36 miles a gallon. Right. They'd go further down the chart and see that the Prius or a bunch of other cars were higher than that. And go plus. and buy something that was, yeah. if they cared about fuel economy, that they'd buy something better. And, and but so, you're right. And so it, being working here at the test track, uh, we were always driving home uh, different cars. And I have to say that, that there was a few times in, in my career here where people actually came out of their houses to see what I was driving. One was when we tested the Dodge Viper. And the other one was when the first time I brought home the smart car because they were so intrigued by it. But the, 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 the smart was almost doomed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was more expensive than most small cars. The fuel economy didn't blow us away. Right. And it required premium, premium. gas. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of cars that people have come up and talked to us about, I think you've got another one of those on your list, right? Uh, I, I, and what a great transition <laughs> Keith Perry just made. So what we're driving this week... I don't is, like being approached by strangers. <laughs> <laughs> and he's it, jealous it of big, you not hosting. That's yeah, what it's, it is. It's amazing that we oh, get yeah. Keith even to appear on this podcast because... Well, <laughs> uh, so anyway, we, are, we, we, we drove this week uh, a, a Jeep Gladiator that we rented from the Chrysler Corporation. We'll, we will be buying our own test model. Uh, this is uh, a very intriguing uh, model because uh, it combines a lot of things that a lot of people like. It's got a convertible top, it's got a pickup truck bed, and it's a cool Jeep. Uh, this is not the first Jeep that, uh, the first pickup truck that Chrysler has has made. Uh, according to Chrysler, the first Jeep truck was the Willys Overland, which, de which was uh, debuted in 1947. Mm -hmm. The original Jeep Gladiator was produced from 63 to 87. Uh, then came the Jeep CJ8 Scrambler which was sold from 81 to 85. Uh, and then the Jeep Comanche was based on the Cherokee platform and built from 1986 to 1992. And always had awesome uh, side stripes on it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so, so it's not like they're new to this, but it almost makes you wonder um, you know, why it took them so long to, to, put, to put a pickup truck bed on the back of the Wrangler. Yeah. So, I mean, this was, um, we had some uh, some holidays last week and, and cars came up in conversation and the Gladiator was one I got asked about a lot. And I, I think, judging by my little, little anthropological uh, assessment, that I think people want, there's a subset of people who want an honest car, a car that, you know, something that looks like a truck and also drives like a truck. You know, the F-150 is amazing because you get in it and it does basically everything that a luxury sedan would do. But some people want something that, you know, it, that has a stick shift, that has, um, you know, that, that that rides kind of rough and doesn't. The Nissan Frontier, for example. <laughs> well, exactly. But they also <laughs> care about, about safety. And it's interesting. One person I was talking to, he's in his 60s, and he's thinking, you know, I'd love to get an antique pickup truck, but I want... Uh, blind spot warning. I want Bluetooth. all the latest safety. I want CarPlay, <laughs> and the Gladiator eh, kind of does it. And you know, for the, I mean, FCA seems like they're going to be selling these things. They already have a lease deal out that's under two hundred a month with five thousand do it signing. Wow. And what that means is they're expecting these things to hold on to their value, basically. Right. So uh, there, there is this small but you know real diehard subset of people who I think want something that's. Honest, but, but John, do, do you think do you think the Gladiator has legs? I mean, do you think do you think this is going to hold up? I and mean, right now, it's hot. And everyone's after it. How's it going to be in, in a year, two years? Oh goodness! If I if I so if I would, could prognosticate out there, I would you know either buy I'd either go long or short on <laughs> on the uh, by buying a short, one. That's a short bed. Well, buying one and putting it away. <laughs> um, well, look, there were there are conversions out there for the older Jeep Wranglers. Um, I think that first of all, Jeep Chrysler FCA didn't. Didn't build it because they were selling a ton of Jeeps anyway. The Wrangler is extremely popular, um, and like Keith said, holds their, they hold their value. Uh, will it be down the road? It, it could be because you don't have that Dodge Dakota mm -hmm. size pickup truck. They don't have that small compact truck. And I think that it, it actually, in some ways, it is a little more useful than the Wrangler. Our tested Wrangler, when we took off the doors and the roof, there was, it was a, like a security-ish issue. Um, this one, again, if you take the doors off from the roof, it's the same thing, but there is more storage in it with the back seat. Right. And then you have the bed. I think it's actually kind of cool. Um, the long wheelbase actually helps it with driving, you know, driving it on, on the highway. It, it has smoothed out the, the ride a little bit. Yes, it's a borrowed, rented press car. But, um, you know, it's, it's a little more livable. I, I, I can't say it's, it's going to be a commuter or you should commute in it. Um, some Jeep people might. It, it's just unique. You have a little bed. You can you could do 
more, you could park it, it's more, it's a little more nimble, it's a little easier to live with than a pickup truck. Um, but it still has that dump run, carry brush, carry your snowblower, maybe, I, I, I don't know exactly the size of them, maybe a quad. You know, maybe you can put something up there with the tailgate down. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's a little more flexible. Yeah, outdoor right. living kind of. Yeah, some right. of the lifestyle stuff too. Yep. You can yep. Yeah, you know, I, I looked upon the Wrangler. Uh, I'm sorry, the Wrangler, the 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 Gladiator, is that you know it it, it is it, it, there's too many compromises for me because it's it's not really a great convertible. Um, it, it's not a great pickup truck because the bed is pretty small, mm -hmm. um, and it it has some compromises in its jeepness because of the longer wheelbase. The diehards are, might have some more issue of it going off road. And, and, and my wife, who's way smarter than me, came up with this excellent line. Uh, she said, uh, it's a Jeep of all trades, but it's a master of none. And that's, that's how I, that's, that's the assessment that I come up with the Gladiator. You know, I think a lot of pickup trucks, though, if it's bought for, for fanciness, they're compromised as well. I mean, short bed pickup truck, a lot of people say, like, why, are they, why are we selling an F-150 crew cab with a five-foot bed? I can't use it, so I need to get a bigger bed. Right. So somewhere here, you know, it, it, it's a little maybe more real. Like, I know this is the bed size. I know what I'm going to do with it versus I'm driving a pickup truck. Hello, and it's a King Ranch, <laughs> 90000 you know, 50000 $60,000, $70,000 truck. And I don't, floating above the road. And I don't yeah. do any work in it. Yeah. Right. You know, so I'm, I'm going to go and say I think it has legs. If dealers use it as a pure profit maker and charge a premium to make it something exclusive and try to get a five or ten thousand dollar markup, that's going to hurt it. Yes. And so I've if also the dealer heard the dealers, network. Oh, sorry, I, I've heard that dealers have actually been been forced to take uh, cars that they didn't necessarily want in order to get an allocation for this. Wow. Oh, which yeah, is an that interesting makes sense. thing too. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to want to get as much as possible to move all those cars that they, those they had over, to take that they didn't want. Those leftover Dodge Darts out by the Detroit airport still and sitting the, there. In 2018 Dodge journeys. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's, it's true. Well, <clears throat> anyway, stay tuned. We're going to be buying our own Gladiator and uh, we'll have more information on this as we get our own test model. And that brings us to one of our favorite parts of every Talking Cars podcast, and that's taking your questions. Questions. We have a number of, of video questions to get to. Keep them coming, whether they're text or video, to talkingcars at iCloud.com. The first question we've got is Malik from Mississippi. So let's play. I work for an auto glass company, and I've noticed that typically the average windshield is between three and four hundred dollars, but with lane departure warning, automatically automatic emergency braking, forward collision warning, and so on and so forth. Those camera systems have to be re, be recalibrated to recognize new glass, and that can drive the price up to eight hundred dollars, all the way up to, I mean, even fifteen hundred dollars in some vehicles I see. But with it being just so much more expensive, I just really want to know what you guys really think about that. So we're seeing that the price of windshields are possibly going up because of all this extra uh, active safety features. Mm. Uh, Keith, what, what's your answer to Malik about this? Uh, well, is you're right. And also, I'm working on a story about this. You, you email, text us again, and, and I'd love to quote you in it because uh, it seems like you have a lot of expertise here. Uh, talking cars at iCloud.com? Okay. Exactly. Exa I'm serious. Please. <laughs> Super um, Dave Abrams like that. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, no, you're totally right. So one of the reasons why, um, why the pricing is going up is because with all these systems, you need to get an original equipment part. Uh, that means if you have a Subaru, uh, you need to get a Subaru windshield. You can't get some sort of aftermarket windshield that's typically cheaper. The good news is that most insurance companies, when an automaker says no aftermarket parts, you have to put uh, the original parts on it, they'll pay for that. So if you have insurance coverage that includes windshield coverage, which is mandatory in a lot of states, um, but not in others, uh, the good news is that your insurance will be paying for it. They also uh, will likely pay for the recalibration of the sensors. And when you change the glass that's on there, um, you have to bring it to the dealer and get it recalibrated. I mean, we used to get windshields replaced here, mobile. Yeah. Uh, and I talked to uh, John, our, our chief mechanic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and he said, we just bring them to the dealer now because, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, it, we're going to have to bring it to the dealer anyways to get it recalibrated. And that costs money. So, so with, with, with insisting that the windshields be open, OEM, which are mm. usually more expensive than replacement parts, right. yeah. um, are we going to see a rise in insurance premiums? 
you might. Uh, I think one of the interesting things Keith was talking about with us is that because of all these advanced safety features, you may see fewer rear-end accidents. So someone's not going to slam into the back of a car, which will be a problem for both uh, the person they hit, but as well as, as the, uh, the driver, because they may have some sensors, but not, you know, maybe, maybe they just have a warning, but not automatic emergency braking. Um, but also headlights are much more expensive now. Mm -hmm. A lot of body work. You know, there's, there's so much technology in the front of a car now that it's easy to get the car totaled just from a rear end accident. So maybe the reduction in the rear end accidents w will offset right. this. But it's up to actuar actuarials, you know, actua you think, actuaries think with their actuaries. This is actuaries. not talking actuaries. Yeah, because, exactly. Uh, that's one of those podcasts you listen to to go to sleep. Out of, heart, out yeah. of the insurance company. Uh, but hey, if you're up in Hartford, three uh, yes. miles well, in, north of insurance here. Insurance capital of the world. What a come great on question. down to the track and tell us about, tell us all about this so we can learn about it. So, uh, and go to sleep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, thanks, thanks, Malik. Great question. Uh, the next uh, video question we have is Daniel from Virginia, a loyal viewer. Yay. Uh, um, well, so let's uh, let's roll that tape. Hey guys, my name is Daniel. Big fan of the show. I've been watching since episode one. Uh, one topic I've heard you talk about several times is automated cars and the difficulty with this sort of gray area of that it's not completely controlling the car and that people still need to be aware of it. I I'm a licensed pilot and I fly lots of Cessnas and Pipers, which are basically the Toyota Camrys and Accords of the skies, and. We are taught, these have autopilots, and we're taught what stages of flight are appropriate to use it, what stages of flight are inappropriate to use it, and if we see it doing something we don't want it to do, to disengage it immediately and to fly the plane manually. And to an extent, that philosophy works pretty well, so I'm not sure why everybody is like, we've never done this before, and that you can't just apply the lessons learned from the aviation side to the automotive side. So, automated cars versus autopilots on planes. John, what, what advice do you have for this? So initially I was, I was a little, I, I would just go and say, look, it's just harder to get an air, you know, get an air, a pilot's license. Um, so I looked in Connecticut and pilot license requirements as well as DMV requirements to get a driver's license. Connecticut pilot, 11 hours of video watching, then minimum of 20 hours flying a Cessna 152, then an additional minimum of 20 hours to solo in this, you know, I have to fly a 152 as well. Um, so it's minimum. You know, if, if you're not doing particularly well, the, the, the school instructor may say, eh, you need to come back. Okay. To get a uh, driver's license in Connecticut, uh, high school or secondary driver education, 30 hours in the classroom, two hours of parent training as well, and 40 hours of practice driving, I, I'm... I have to say, I don't know exactly how they log that, if it's a log book or if it's just kind of a wink and a nod with the parents driving around. But, you know, a good amount of time. I still think that it's, it's harder to get a pilot's license. There's, it, there, there's, there's fewer pilots. They could be very, you know, much more um, diligent. It costs a lot more. And that's probably where it comes to the difference, where it's expensive to get a driver's license. You know, there's, there's a cost. Private driving school, not every school out there. Um, you know, public school system has a, has a driver ed, but it, there's almost like a churn of just get it out, get it out, get it out, and and there's just not the diligence there. So maybe you're expected to have, you're get a driver's you're license. You're expected, right? You know, and and you have to move forward with more and more uh, education as far as the, the autopilot and stuff. It, it's it's just maybe in the world of pilots, and it's not in the world of driving yet because it's not nearly as widespread. You know, there's there's just people who, parents who aren't used to it, and kids who are learning how to drive, and it's just not dovetailing at this point. Maybe down the road it will. Right, so it's always like, in, in theory, this, this all this makes all the sense in the world. I mean, mm. uh, yeah, the, the cars that drive themselves, the, the planes that fly themselves and stuff like that, but uh, certainly a lot more traffic uh, per square inch well, on the true. ground than in the air. Mm. So anyway. I mean, there is, there is a potential of someone not, not following the rules of flight and, you know, coming across, you know, a jet, a jet you know, it, it could be also, uh, you know, huge mass death, but this, it's, it, there, there will be some kind of 
convergence, I believe. Right. It's, it's interesting. just not there, right now. There are a lot of people who, do, who work in, uh, in aviation automation and, and who are talking about this. And there's a guy named Steve Kasner. Uh, there's a, a former fighter pilot named Missy Cummings. And they're, they're both doing this work and talking about this. So if you're interested in that, look them up. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that you talk about you know, phases of flight and limiting things to that. That's, that's one of the reasons why we like Super Cruise is because essentially right. it, it limits you to use you know, autom automation to when you are in a low stress environment. And, and this so is, it's not this takeoffs the, and landings, it's we had cruise altitude, and essentially. This is the Cadillac system that, yes. we, that we've right. tested and, and, and written about uh, extensively. Yeah. Uh, anyway, great, great question. We're always interested in what's going on with, with technology, and we're going to be, uh, you know, monitoring this as, as we go forward. Uh, it brings us to our next video question. This is Maximo from New York. Go Yankees, love your hat. Uh, who's got a question about EV charging outlets, so um, let's run it. Quick question regarding electric vehicle charging stations. So I'm on a road trip using my Tesla Model 3 and they have the Tesla superchargers. They have this adapter for the J1772, it's very popular. I'm at this EVGO fast charging. They use the Shadowmo and CCS Go fast charging and they're not compatible with the best selling electric vehicle, which doesn't make any sense. My question is, will we ever have a standard charging system for charging stations around the U.S. for electric vehicles as they get more popular? So, Keith, great question. Why the heck aren't all the EV outlets standardized? <laughs> yeah, so there are a lot of vested interests here. So there are basically, there, there are kind of a couple of standards out there. So there's one called Chatamo, and that uh, is basically the, the Japanese standard. There's one called CCS, and that's the EU standard, and also something that a lot of American automakers with worldwide sales have agreed to. And those are the two chargers that are on uh, that, that charging station that you're parked at. Uh, now, there actually are uh, adapters for Chatamo for the Model S and the Model X. There is not one for the Model 3. Their charging plug may be better in a lot of ways. CCS has its advantages, but the problem is, is that all these car makers have kind of coalesced to their own standards. And those standards have existed for a long time. And way before your car was the best-selling EV, the, the Nissan Leaf and the Renault Zoe, were, one of those isn't even sold in the right. U.S., was a top seller, and that uses Chatamo. Uh, there's uh, uh, something, some of the best-selling EVs are from China, which is the largest market. It's over 60% of EVs are sold in China. They use a bunch of standards and they have their own proprietary standard. And I think this is still an ongoing issue. I don't have a good answer for you. And it's not just like charging a, changing an outlet in your house. These are multi-million dollar investments. Well, but that, that's what I was thinking, John. It's like you, you go to Home Depot, you buy a lamp for your home, but you gotta make sure that, that oh, is, is this the right plug? We don't, we don't have to worry about that. We're buying normal electronics from, from our day-to-day -day life. Mm. Yeah, um, short answer is, look, it's fledgling. Um, look, Keith covered excellent points. Keith made a very strong argument and a very informative uh, argument there. At, at the best, I could say, look, Tesla has its own investments, like we talked about. Uh, they have a reason to make their owners satisfied and not have anyone else blocking up their superchargers. Uh, potentially, there's licensing, and you know, other companies don't want to go there and license it. You know, t Tesla plug, you know, Tesla um, adapters, you know, or, or um, chargers. It's 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 again fledgling industry. We're going to have to see it sort out. Um, hopefully. Licensing equals money, and you know we'll go forward yeah. from that. Yeah, I can't. You, I can't add to it. Either. And when the automakers are also the ones installing the chargers, obviously there's going to be you know some protection of their interests as well. It's a Sony so. memory card versus an SD card. You know, Apple uh, Lightning yeah. versus USB, USB C. You know. Beta Max versus VC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you see that, and you see it, so, and you see it sort out. <laughs> I had a Beta Max. I'm not it was technologically I'm not, superior. I'm not it's surprised. Are you surprised at that, that he had a Beta Max? <laughs> well, you were ahead of your time, but you, you guessed wrong. Mm. Anyhow, uh, great question. Let's move on to the next. We can uh, bail all of ourselves out of this one, though. No. Um, <laughs> the next question is uh, uh, concerning the new Hyundai venue, and this is coming from Joanne. Hi, mm -hmm. folks. I'm looking to buy a small to mid-sized SUV. When will you be testing the new Hyundai Venue, which seems perfect for a senior citizen like me? I was really impressed by it at the New York Auto Show. Also, I know that the Subaru Forester is a highly recommended vehicle for seniors, but what, would you, but what do you think of the Hyundai Tucson for seniors? Are there other SUVs that you would recommend? 
So great, great, uh, great question. I was, I was hoping for somehow we could get through talking cars without talking about SUVs, but alas, we have to deal with it. No, I'm just kidding. We like SUVs. So John, um, you have a recommendation for Joanne. Yes, not an SUV. Kia Soul. <laughs> um, it's, it's a, it's a roomy, boxy, very useful, not utilitarian vehicle. Um, good door openings, easy to get in and out of. It is one of our recommended used uh, vehicles or recommended vehicles for seniors, but mm -hmm. the used one is no, not worse than the new one. The new one's nice, but get the used one. It, it did very well in our tests. Um, I would I would just say that one. Excellent. Um, great, great answer. It's front wheel drive. That's the only thing. Let right. me step on you there. It is a front wheel drive vehicle. If she needs all wheel drive for some reason, okay, but you could just get winter tires which actually in many places, cases will perform, the vehicle will perform better than an all-wheel drive uh, SUV with all-season tires. So, Keith now, Soul. Now, Keith, you had a kind of a, a, a different answer than John. Yeah, I actually had Joanne's answer, which is, I, I'm with you. I totally, I, I saw the venue at the New York Auto Show. I thought it was one of the coolest cars I've seen. I also predicted, uh, in, in I feel like Nostradamus here, I predicted that this would be, Karnak the Magnificent says, <laughs> that the venue would be, even though it was aimed at Gen Z, it's aimed at sort of today's late high school, early college folks, um, it's actually going to be more popular with seniors. And I think that's because the same things at, 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 at different phases in life are always popular. Um, the fact that it is sort of SUV-ish, it has that higher seating position, may make it easier to get in and out of. I know for some people, it's actually uh, SUVs are harder to get in and out of. Um, it, it all depends on you, so make sure you test drive it. Right. But I like the fact that it comes with a ton of standard safety equipment. It's inexpensive. Um, it, it, it's very versatile. You can fold down those seats, and it's a very small car, so it's very easy to park, but you can still fit some things in the back because of its boxy shape. Like the Soul, it is... Um, it is front wheel drive only. So you're not gonna have that if you live in the snow belt, um, it's gonna be a little, it's gonna maybe not be the best choice for you. But otherwise, it's practical, it's affordable. Uh, it goes on sale this winter, right? Yeah, end of uh, fourth quarter. Um, yeah, so that's when we'll be testing it. And I recommend that before we even get to it, go to the dealer and, and try and get try in and out of it. Um, because that's something I know, at least you know, with my parents, that that's, that's something that they always do with, with cars to see where, what's, what's comfortable for them. It's yeah. interesting that you talked about how they're marketing this vehicle to younger people, but it looks like seniors might get into it, which is exactly what happened with Scion, mm -hmm. the, the Scion XB. The Honda Element. Right, the exactly. Scion, yep. It was supposed to be, oh, we're <clears> going to get a younger audience, and then the, the older people started buying it. Yeah. Well, Joanne, uh, that was a great question. Uh, my recommendation would be to go with the Subaru Forester. I know that seems kind of boring, but uh, I, I love how the Forester drives. I love the visibility of it. Uh, I think it's super easy to get in and out of. Mm. And unlike uh, the Hyundai, uh, I think there's just a that there's a smidge more room in the back. Uh, it's a little bit bigger vehicle, I think, than the venue, and and I think that that what might you know turn out to be a little bit more useful. Um, you know, grandkids, forward. who knows? Well, we, yeah, you know your yeah. situation. We don't know your situation. Kona yeah. might be an alternative depending on size. Right. I, yeah. I Consumer Reports topic. But. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. As always, if you want to learn more about the topics or the cars that we talked about, check out the show notes. We really appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you next week. <laughs>